The House of Leadership stands on a foundation of courage, and not valorous courage, like a battlefield courage, but an intestinal courage that you have within you, first of all, to state who you are, to state what you want to do, what you want to have as your work by myself and your vision. That takes a lot of courage. Welcome to the Optimized Workplace. Joining me today is J.R. Flatter, an ICF accredited coach focused on the leadership development and improvement of commercial and government workspaces. JR has worked across the enterprise and organizations, really delivering experiential adult learning methods. So we're so excited to welcome you to the show, JR. So welcome. No, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So JR and I sit, um, we're part of the, what we call the Beltway Bandit crew of GovCons that sit all around the DMV. So we're coming to you live from here in the Washington area. And JR, I know your work it touches both the federal and the commercial side of things. And I'm so curious from your perspective, um, tell us a little bit more about your work. And then I want to really get into the organizational performance of where we see things today. We are a leadership development, coaching, and a coach training company. And so if you think about leading complex organizations in the 21st century, Uh, creating a culture that attracts and retains world-class talent. Um, That's what we're all about. Uh, Specifically focused on coaching cultures and coaching styles of leadership, which I'm sure we'll get into more detail as you and I chat. Absolutely. So with that, you're obviously talking quite a bit to the C-suite and I'm assuming senior managers. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I was just reading a, a report this morning from the advisory board around the high levels of stress and burnout that we're seeing as a result of the turnover and people really searching for the ideal uh, workspace environment, particularly in this remote hybrid uh, environment. So what are you hearing from your clients with regards to what that looks like today? Everybody's trying to get people back in the offices. The employees are kicking and screaming, don't want to go back. So what's really affecting our organizational performance and how are leaders dealing with that? Yeah, there's several things going on. Um, You mentioned a few of them already. It's a global labor market and it's a virtual global labor market. And where you sit, it's a much more freelance labor market. And so I have three sheepskins hanging on my wall from three different universities. How relevant is that now in the 21st century versus knowledge, skills, abilities, and experiences? It's so One of the things I tell the senior leaders that we work with is you can go into the 21st century standing tall and proud, or you can go kicking and screaming. Mm. Uh, Either way, you're going. Uh, The workforce is bringing you there. Um, And so it's part of what you're asking is an intergenerational difference in how we view work, Mm. uh, what we view work as, where we perform work, uh, what it requires to be uh, able and uh, educated and experienced sufficiently is changing. So we work with our with senior leaders to help them navigate uh, the 21st century. And it's not an analog versus a digital, but there are you know, 20th century versus 20th century very significant differences. Uh, I'm a technology immigrant. Uh, a lot of people I work with are technology natives. You know, I just had a young man in my office literally five minutes ago, you know, showing me some fundamental technological thing, which is quite common. So we help navigate all of that. Something you mentioned, I think, is a compelling theme that is coming up over and over again, and that's the convergence of generations. And I was sitting um, in a, a thought leadership event maybe about six weeks ago um, at Ernst & Young, and they had a futurist uh, actually um, share a slide deck around what we can look forward to. You know, EY is one of those organizations like a Deloitte or McKinsey that's at the cutting edge of what is needed. And they consult with organizations around that. And they were talking quite a bit about the future of generations. And they did a, an excellent uh, uh, diagram and then really just a lot of infographics around, you know, what the X is, Generation X wanted, what Generation Z wanted, uh, what the what the new next generation is going to require, what baby boomers were looking like, and how those generations are so different, how we learn, how we start to use technology, 
um, what's the drivers. It was really fascinating. And I'm curious, as you play in this space around convergence of generation, what are you seeing are going to be, you know, the top uh, uh, impact levels for leaders today in terms of what they need to be successful with maybe not even their predecessors, but people coming even behind them, you know, because we have quite a few millennials, right, that are sitting between that. I think it's what, 29 to 40 age group now. So they're now managing the Zers that are coming behind them. In some cases, they're managing baby boomers. You know, I have a very uh, youthful team, I like to say, uh, in management with my organization. And they are called upon to be able to do that double parlay, right, in terms of balance and and management. But what are some of the skill sets that you're seeing that are really critical when you're going into to, um, to to coach organizations and leaders around performance? Yeah, huge, huge question. From the entire intergenerational discussion, I often wonder, is it generational or is it age or some combination of both? Uh, as you study this challenge, uh, historically, people have been complaining about the youth for time immemorial. Uh, <laughs> You can see scribings on cave walls about the slothfulness of the youth of the day. (laughs) Literally, uh, Shakespeare wrote in 1599 about the generations and the frustrations between the generations. And so it's a perennial challenge that I think is somewhat age-related and and somewhat is the environment. Um, You know, millennials are CEOs now. Mm -hmm. And millennials are starting to make comments on Gen Z's and you know, it's, it's starting over again. And so taking that into account, but also taking into account as a Gen Z looks at the 50 year career that's in front of them, you probably realize most of us are going to be live 50 years after our 50th birthday. And so that's a long runway. Let's hope. Let's hope. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Take care of yourself. That uh, is the desire. I will say <laughs> that is the desire, right? <laughs> And so when a Gen Z looks at that 50-year runway in front of them or 70-year runway in front of them, personally and professionally as an adult, and what's the predictability? The the degree I received in business administration from the University of Washington in 1990, I got some predictability. That's going to be relevant probably for the rest of my life. Uh, but when a Gen Z is looking at that, how much of that is predictable Mm. um, into the future. And so they're looking at dedication to self, dedication to their career, more so than dedication to an organization. You know, the idea that you're going to go, a good friend of mine, his grandfather worked in the same building doing the same job for 50 years. Those days are gone in the same industry doing uh, the same tasks. And so it's not selfish for them to say, I got to take care of myself. I have to think about what's good for me and my career and my family. So that there's the intergenerational, there's the, what can I have to expect in front of me? I think it's all coming into play. And the last thing I'll say is one of the tools we use, we use is a framework we call the house of leadership. There's a lot of leadership frameworks. We just use this one. It, It helps us guide people through deciding what are their principles? What's their vision? What's their work family self? A lot of other decisions uh, that we help them work through. And one of the things we teach is everyone gets their own house. Your house is very different than mine. Your experiences, your education, your gender, your ethnicity, all of those go into your house of leadership. And yours is very different than mine, even if we've known each other our entire lives. And so we don't judge each other's houses. And we decide if we are going to work together, what are those few things we need to agree on? And those are our core values. Those are our principles that we share. But everything else is yours and Mm -hmm. not to be judged by me or anyone else. So just recognizing someone might be in a very different generation than you are, come from a very different place than you are, heading to a very different vision than you are. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. Um, are they doing what they need to do? Or are we, the things that we agreed on, are we conforming to those agreements? Long I love answer that. to a short question. <laughs> no, that's that's great. You know, it, it just makes me think, you know, on a very uh, base level, like we can all play in the same, same sandbox, but we need to recognize, again, that we're all playing. And so we all, 
there's space for all of us, right? There's enough sand to go around, but how are we going to divvy it up and, and play, play friendly and play nice? I'm curious, as you were speaking of that, I was automatically thinking, you know, what are you watching in these organizations? So when you're called in, you know, to work with key leaders around this framework, are there two or three measurement factors that you're looking for to really see, um, you know, the potential of a leader to outperform or to do better or an area they're working on, like initially, immediately comes to mind, like the EQ framework, right? We all know sure. emotional intelligence and, and what that looks like. And it was interesting. I was just called out to do a keynote on emotional intelligence. And I was like, hmm, okay, so it still does have a major bearing on how people are thinking and showing up. But I'm just curious, are there any specific measurement factors that you find are now more compelling than others? So in our house of leadership, there are four pillars. And, you know, somebody who's written policy for a living, you always write absolutely little, as little as possible because everything you put down, you're taking someone's freedom from them. But there are some things you need to write down. And so the first pillar for us is principles and then not judgmental principles. What's important to you? What's right and wrong? Where are your left and right parameters, personally and professionally? Because you have to be able to answer those things for yourself in order to work with others to say, what do we agree on? And then Mm -hmm. what everything else um, is yours. And those things that we determine we must agree on better be existential, right? Not annoyances. Like a lot of intergenerational is annoyance, right? The way they dress, the way they communicate. Uh, It's not existential. So that's the first one. You have to be able to tell yourself in the world who you are and what you stand for. Secondly, and I have a PhD, so I get to make stuff up. So I made this up. <laughs> but it goes to what you're talking about. It's this continuum from technical cognitive to emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. And when we're relatively new in our career, technical intelligence is all, what we're all about. How well do we know the law? How well do we know the human body? But as you mature as a leader, and you can stay in that technical place your whole life. And we need those people um, to do those very important tasks. Mm-hmm. But as you grow and decide, hey, I can lead people. I want to be a leader. You know, this cognitive and then eventually this maturation in, to an emotionally intelligent leader, which I would say most of your time is spent building and sustaining relationships with other human beings. Absolutely. Are you willing to give up being the best technical to become that emotionally intelligent 21st mm-hmm. century leader. People struggle with that. The third pillar is work, family, self. What does work mean to you? Uh, what does family mean to you? Are you taking care of yourself along this long, lifelong journey? And then finally, vision. Where are you going? I scare a lot of Gen Zs when I ask them, where do you want to be in 30 years? And suddenly they've thought of themselves as 50 something for the first time. But you need to have that kind of vision because otherwise, how do you know what's important to you and where to apply your energies? And, you know, if you get to that 30 year vision, who's there with you? And are you still working? What have you done with your life? Where are you living? You know, those kind of big, big questions. So that's the first thing we do. We put all those four pillars in place and have an interactive conversation because there's a lot of give and take. If I say my 30 year vision is to, well, I'll give you my own three from my first 30 years as an adult, raise my children as a family, educate them, and then create some financial freedom. But my work, family self, my uh, technical, cognitive, and emotional alignment, and my principles all had to come together with that vision to make it actually happen. Yeah. And so as a coach, we don't judge you, but we observe. And we say, you know, week after week, month after month, you've told me you want to do this one thing, but your principles don't seem to be aligned with that. Your Mm -hmm. work family self seems to be out of balance with that. And so we work together to, as coaches, to help them get all those things in place to go make it happen. Yeah, there's three things that are like illuminating as you were speaking. Uh, that you share that I think are critical for anyone who's listening to this conversation and you're thinking about your own organization or you even thinking about yourself and how you're, I like to say, rising up, you know, from the, from the dust, you know, so you're really rising above 
others. And I love the idea of really being connected to who you are, what you want to become so that you're willing to move away from that technical piece Mm -hmm. uh, and what that really means. Cause that's powerful, as you said, and it's very difficult for some, I I, I'm in a a CEO group called um, pinnacle and I participate in advisory, but I also lead advisory for CEOs. And uh, it's really interesting to watch those that, you know, they build these companies, some, you know, eight figure, nine figure companies, and they're so technical, especially the, the IT folks. They're so technical in what they do and they're so married to it and they still love it with so much passion. It's very uncomfortable sometimes to step away from that, but you have to step away as a CEO in order to grow. You know, Jeff Bezos did not stay on the front line of coding. If he mm-hmm. can even code, I don't even know if he can code, right? <laughs> you know, once he was really trying to expand the the enterprise, right? Obviously, he doesn't know how to um, launch a rocket ship, but he certainly knows how to ride in one. So, mm-hmm. you know, you've got to figure out where you're going to play and, and what position you really want. And I think you're absolutely right. It parlays well into the vision. You have to be really clear as a leader, as a CEO, what have you, what's the vision that you really want to create for your life? And I loved what you said. You know, coincidentally, I took my team out for um, what we call a mid-year retreat yesterday. And it was just, I told them all yesterday was all about them, Mm. even though it was, you know, part arrow bodies and part them. But it was really interesting because we talked a lot about at the end of the life when it's finished and you said, this is where I want to be. Is that really what you wanted? Right. Sometimes we all want the big salary and we want the big house. But, you know, and, and a couple of folks said, yeah, I thought that, you know, once I you know made, you know, X thousands of dollars more or I got that house that it was going to look like this or feel like this. And it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And um, one young lady on our team, I loved what she said. She's like, yeah, I realized that, you know, it's more important for me to be able to have the freedom to take my kids to Six Flags, you know, a couple of times a month during the summer than necessarily, you know, sit and move up the ladder faster because I won't get those years back. And I, I really complimented her on that because I think when you are in the grind and you're on the ladder, and you're really trying to drive, you're really trying to go further in your organization, you have to think about the sacrifice and there's always a sacrifice. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, let me dovetail into that. How do you help then those same leaders with uh, being okay with the sacrifice? And accepting that um, and authentically. Yeah. Wow. What a great word. Authentically. Uh, that's what the house is all about. Are you building an authentic house? So I'll go back to the, one of the original ideas that it's non-judgmental. Your journey is yours. What we do ask is have these conversations with people in your life that matter to you because they're coming along with you. And so the significant others in your life, whomever they might be. Make sure you're having a conversation about what are we doing? Where are we going? Otherwise, you might very well end up there by yourself or not there at all. But then the the non-judgmental piece is your vision is yours. Uh, Your family self is yours. Um, Whether you decide to be a technical cognitive or an emotional uh, intelligence person, that's yours. Um, Your principles are yours to the extent that We agree that we have to work together, um, want to work together. Everything else is yours. Everything else is mine. So as a coach, we're very careful not to judge those houses. We're also very observant what you're saying you want to do. And then the, so that's the communication. What are you demonstrating? So you're communicating, you want to have this vision, but then are you demonstrating that? Uh, And if you're not, then we're going to have a conversation about the misalignment between what you're communicating and then what you're demonstrating. This goes back to culture, right? If I'm communicating that people are important, yet I'm not demonstrating, um, a coach is going to point that out to you. In a coaching culture, you're going to get called out for that. You're telling me this is important, but I don't see you doing it. Like vacations, right? If I say vacation is important, but I never take one, and what's the team doing? They're watching that. And like the boss doesn't take a vacation, but they're telling me it's important. Uh, you know, what's that all about? But then the non judgmental piece is whatever your vision is, go make it happen. And I'm going to do everything in my power to help you do that. It might be very different than what mine is. 
And this goes back to what is work in the 21st century? Um, if you're trying to break out of intergenerational poverty or you're brand new mm. to a certain world, I just spoke to a young lady who was the first college graduate in, her, in the lineage of her entire family. Mm. You know, what does that mean? And how hard are you willing to work to break out of that? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to judge you. You might work 20 hours a day for years to break out of that. Or you might choose, you know what? It's just not worth it to me. Um, I'm going to work. I'm going to provide a, a comfortable life. Uh, but that's what work means. And a coach and a coaching culture is going to accept that. Last thing, and then I'll, I'll be quiet. Um, when we build an organization, every spot in that organization delivers value, whether they're in the mailroom or the C-suite. And in a coaching culture, as an emotionally intelligent 21st century leader, I'm going to love you and respect you equally, no matter where you are in that org chart. Mm -hmm. If you didn't contribute value, I wouldn't have that space. You wouldn't have a desk. You wouldn't have a computer. You wouldn't have a job. And so if I choose to stay a coder or uh, whatever you are in that technical or cognitive space, um, a coaching culture is going to give you the same respect, um, the same encouragement. Um, one of the reasons we talk about personal and professional achievement is that technical coder, they have a family that loves them. They have children when they come in the door in the evening. Daddy, mommy, so glad you're home. Uh, they deserve the same amount of respect as anyone else. Hmm. That's rich, JR. You're absolutely right. I think that so often we kind of take that for granted, right? Who we are and everything is 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 reduced to labels and mm. titles and even for ourselves. And um, I think not being willing to see your own brilliance is a big takeaway that I'm hearing from, from what you just shared. So thank you for that. You know, as we're bringing this conversation to a close, I'm curious if there's one or two nuggets that uh, you would like to leave behind with our audience. So our audience is a, is a variety of C-suite, GovCons, for those of you who don't know that term, is government contractors, sure. but a lot of government uh, industry folks. And then some from, I would say, the uh, building industry, right? Because Aerobodies is known for our design and sustainability work that we do in the fitness and wellness space. So it's, a, I'd say, a, like a wide swath. Are there one or two nuggets that you would like to leave behind with our audience as they're thinking about, hey, could we use some professional coaching or some organizational development as we're trying to to approach the future of now that we all find ourselves in? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. Thanks uh, for the opportunity. One, the House of Leadership stands on a foundation of courage and not valorous courage, like a battlefield courage, but an intestinal courage that you have within you to go. First of all, to state who you are, to state what you want to do, what you want to have as your work with yourself and your vision. That takes a lot of courage uh, to tell yourself even, hey, this is what I want to do with my life. And then to tell others, this is what I want to do. Well, this is what we want to do on our journey together as a family, as a company, as a nonprofit. So be courageous. Secondly, we teach a lot. We teach a global cohort of coaches. And I start another cohort, August 1st, another global cohort. People literally all over the world, different professions, ages, ethnicities, genders. The fourth slide is always the same, uh, whether it's coaching relationship or a coaching journey. This journey is going to change your life. Mm. And people, day one, I say it, hour one, day one. Um, people are naturally skeptical. We've been sold a lot of things that weren't quite what we thought they were going to be when they showed up. Uh, but I'm so confident in what coaching and a coaching culture can do for you. I state, that even when I do, I did a 90 minute keynote earlier this week. Even when I do the 90 minute keynote, I say, this conversation is going to change your life. Mm. It changes the way you listen, the way you ask questions the way you make decisions, the way you parent and partner, both personally and professionally. It's a really, really powerful 
tool, a life-changing transformational tool. Uh, I asked, I'm coaching a very senior leader in the government right now. Can't tell you who or where, but the most senior leader in our government, leaders in our government have coaches. Mm -hmm. And then C-suites, as you know. But the first time I talked to him and said, hey, you ever thought about getting a coach? He looked at me like, who are you? Do you know who I am? (laughs) 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 But I kept at it. And about a year and a half later, he says, you know what? Let's give this a try. And Mm -hmm. it's magnificently powerful for him. So wherever you are in your understanding and appreciation of this thing called coaching and a coaching culture, give it a try. Um, If you're going to build a coaching culture, you need external coaches such as myself and others. But you also need to build internal coaches. Mm -hmm. So. Put a few of your C-suite, your senior leaders into a coaching and just watch what happens. Uh, Whenever we start uh, a coach training, I always point out graduation day, whether it's a 30-hour boot camp or we do an 80-hour, 16-week course. I said, invite your friends and family now to graduation because it's going to be a two-hour testimonial to the journey you've been on. Because we, they self-select speakers and those speakers have five to 10 minutes to talk about the journey. And it's always really powerful, transformational testimonials about the journey. I'll pause there and see what your thoughts are. <laughs> I think that's a great place to to end. I think that you have left some really uh, gems that people need to think about when it comes to coaching. I know I have benefited for a couple of decades now, um, not just in my business, but personally. And I think you're absolutely right. Um, And I'm sure you get this quite a bit too. When people say, you know, there's just something about you. For me, it's energy. My word is energy, but Mm. there's something about you and what you manifest and what you're able to bring forward authentically that people really tap into. And once you recognize that it becomes even more powerful and it's definitely due to a lot of coaching that I've received. Um, personally and professionally, and from those who um, were have been just been mentors over the years. But I think Jr. is absolutely right. So if you are sitting on the fence and you've thought about it for your organization, Jr. and his organization, all their information will be in our show notes today. Um, and thank you all for joining us for the Optimized Workplace. Uh, I'm your host, Brandine Bishop, and remember, it's many, a number of monumental moments, many moments that make the biggest difference in your life. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.